Welcome to The Average Shepherd. My name is Father Sam French, and today is Sunday in the second week of Advent. The homily today is called Speed Camera Christians. The Gospel is Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Let's begin. Arriving on the scene in this week's Gospel, we have St. John the Baptist. He's out in the wilderness, he's baptizing people, and he's calling them to repentance. So hearing these stories as a child, I was always struck by how wild and how out of the ordinary John the Baptist was. And I think it was precisely because of his oddness that I was inspired to take his, yeah, his name as my confirmation name. Now, what is it that makes John the Baptist so interesting? Why were so many thousands of people flocking to see this man out in the wilderness? The gospel tells us in Mark chapter 1, all of Judea, all the people of Jerusalem made their way to him. So despite the fact that he was a little bit strange, John could pull a crowd. He was a real-life influencer. But the question is, why? Well, I think it's because John chose to live in a way that was different to the world around him. He actively rejected a life of wealth, of worldly power, dominance, the leisure, the pleasure that so many around him were no doubt scrambling to have. Funnily enough, however, John could have had that if he wanted. After all, he was the son of Zechariah, as we hear in the scriptures. Zechariah was a temple priest of Israel, which was quite a stable role in society. It's unlikely that John's family was destitute or poor, yet John freely chose to live in the desert to wear camel skin clothes and eat insects. He was doing things that very few people had the courage to do. For that reason, I think people from all around flocked to hear what this man had to say. They would have been wondering in their heart, why on earth this guy gave up everything to live in the wilderness? He must have found meaning in something that the world could not offer. So what was John's message of meaning? What was his secret? Well, I think we hear the answer in the Christmas carol, O Holy Night. And I apologize, I'm going to sing this line. Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth See, the Israelites, those who came before Christ Were desperately thirsting for the forgiveness of sins They felt the brokenness that all of us feel the inescapable attachment to certain vices and sins. In other words, they did not feel whole or complete in their humanity. And the animal sacrifices that were happening in the temple day after day, hour after hour, they just were not cutting it anymore. John came along and he offered them a path of forgiveness through a baptism of repentance. But more importantly, he offered them a hope of a savior who would come and destroy the power of sin altogether and heal the brokenness of our humanity once and for all. So this is the true joy of Christmas, the arrival of the one who heals our deepest wounds, who fulfills our heart in a way that nothing in this world can possibly do. So the birth of Jesus is the greatest consolation that any of us could have ever hoped for. And I think we hear this foreshadowed in the first reading from Isaiah, where the prophet says, Console my people, console them, says your God. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call to her that her sin is atoned for. See, our world right now, it is filled with temptations and with all kinds of desires. Every ad we watch, especially in the, in the lead up to Christmas, they're all promising us some kind of fulfillment, whether it be a holiday, fast food, clothing, or technology. And while all of these kind of ads and these promises, they can, they can undeniably bring us some kind of temporary enjoyment, they cannot scratch that itch deep in our being. The desire that we all have to be made right with God, to have our sins washed away, to be brought into intimate relationship with our Father in heaven. John the Baptist is the ultimate Advent saint. I think he is a pure icon of anticipation for Christ. See, despite his own popularity, St. John says to his followers, someone is following me, someone more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. See, John knew that his message of forgiveness was going to pull in quite the crowd, but the guy who was coming after him was going to draw in the whole world. World, And that is exactly what happened when the word became flesh and dwelt among us and Christ died on the cross for our sins. And in the words of John the Baptist himself, he became the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
See, Jesus has already accomplished this. He has taken away the sins of the world. We are waiting for that in its final fulfillment now in the second coming. We hear in today's second reading from St. Peter. What we are waiting for is what he promised. The new heavens and the new earth, the place where righteousness will be at home. Like St. John the Baptist did, St. Peter is encouraging us to prepare the way, but this time not for Jesus as a little baby in Bethlehem, but in his second coming. Peter says, Then, my friends, while you are waiting, do your best to live lives without spot or stain so that he will find you at peace. What is St. Peter saying here? Well, in his letter, he's asking us to be at peace as we await the Lord's return to judge the living and the dead. He doesn't want us to be living lives that leave us shaking in our boots, you know, scared at every turn, fearful that Jesus is about to spring out of nowhere and trap us and send us to hell. See, I try to remind people, don't be a speed camera Christian, always living in fear. What do I mean? Well, only people who speed live in fear of the speed cameras. See, such people, they have full control of their car, they know the rules of the, wo- uh, of the road perfectly well, and yet they still choose to speed. Why? Well, if we put emergencies aside, it's because of selfishness. The desire to get somewhere quicker, the desire to push out ahead, the desire or the pride of thinking that they know better than the road rules. See, all of these selfish thoughts will suddenly turn to dread, though, when they see the flash of the bright light in their rear view mirror. We could easily avoid such dread, the dread of Christ's judgment, if we put the ego aside and simply drive within the bounds of the law. I think our soul is a little bit like a license. We can keep it by living holy and saintly lives while we wait the day of the Lord. So as Christians, we have no excuse to be surprised when the Lord finally comes, either at at the moment of our death or at his definitive second coming. See, like all the warning signs, in Australia at least, that lead up to a speed camera, God in his mercy gives us warnings again and again. St. Peter says it perfectly. The Lord is not being slow to carry out his promises, as anybody else might be called slow. But he is being patient with you all, wanting nobody to be lost and everybody to be brought to change his ways. Advent, my friends, is the time for that change. There are many ways for us to prepare the way of the Lord in our lives, but in light of today's gospel about John the Baptist, I recommend that we practice sincere repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of God heals more than anything else our deepest wounds. My advice then is this, before Christmas, go to confession. That's simple advice. Before Christmas, go to confession. For those of you who haven't been in a long time, this is the perfect time to start. For those of you who go often, I recommend you do it all the same. This sacrament offers a real encounter with God's mercy and a taste of the joy that we are all awaiting this Christmas. Go to confession. God bless you all. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please share it with someone else who you think might benefit. In the name of the Father and of the Son.